this point, I want to show you how I'm going to do a warping animation. And I'm going to use this photograph I took with Model Glass Olive way back in 2011. And the first step I'm going to do is figure out what I'm going to warp. Uh, warping is where you basically have parts of the photograph move over a particular time period. I would like her tongue to waggle and I'd like the keys to dangle in this photograph. So I'm going to select her and I'm going to remove her from the background. The selection tools I'm going to use are the magic wand and I'm going to use this uh, freehand lasso tool to gather all the areas that the magic wand selected that are the same as the background because there's a lot of black in this photograph. I'm going to use polygonal lasso where I have some straight lines or I have lines uh, in the case of these keys where the black is kind of a shade on the keys and I want to get it all together. I'm going to polygonal lasso around that so I have nice straight lines. Once I have this selection complete, I'm going to copy her onto a new layer and then I'm going to paint the background layer black. The important thing in all of these animations is to have the elements that you want to have move or wiggle around in your photograph be separate from the background. And if that means you shot it green screen style, you shot it against white and found it easy to pull apart, or in a case where you might have arms, uh, if you have the ability to duplicate arms, whatever it is, you need to get that subject off of the background so you can apply your transformations. That figure needs to be on their own layer and the background needs to be on its own layer and it also needs to be a complete background. It can't have a hole where the figure used to be. Otherwise, when you animate the figure, you'll see the hole when, say, the tongue moves away from its natural position. Now that I have her face on her own layer, I'm going to activate Puppet Warp. And Puppet Warp is a function where you place pins down on areas you don't want to move or areas you want to manipulate. So I'm placing pins on her jaw, on her forehead, on the side of her face that's next to the edge. And when I mouse over those pins, if I click on one and move it around, that pin will move in relation to everything else that is in a particular place. So because I have her jaw pinned and her upper lip pinned, those areas won't move. When we do another copy of this and move it around, you'll see that I'll move the jaw up and down. But for this particular one, I'm just going to have it move slightly. Then I'll duplicate that layer by dragging it to that duplicate layer, new layer, uh, turning page icon. Once again, do puppet warp. I'm going to pin down areas I don't want to have move or do want to move. I'd like to make sure I pin the back of her head because I definitely don't want that to move off the side of the frame. Shove the pin on her tongue down. I'm going to lower her jaw a little bit. Because I want the key to dangle and have some gravity, I'm going to put a pin on that and kind of shove it in the other direction as if it's swinging. And now you see I have three versions of her. I'll go ahead and create my animation timeline. I'm going to put it at 0.1 seconds for duration. And I'm going to see what these three frames look like in sequence. And have it do a little forward and backward motion so you'll see four frames. Uh, the second and the fourth frame are the same. It's just where the key kind of bounces back. That's okay. I know we can do a lot better. For one thing, I would like to see the key swing a lot more than it is. So I'm going to once again duplicate that layer, once again puppet warp it to a new position. Once I have a number of key swings, I think I'm going to make her blink. When I look at an animation like this, I feel like two things need to be happening. Uh, if you have a constant loop of one thing, it's a gimmick. If you have alternating loops where there's a constant loop going and then some little change partway through that constant loop, uh, I feel like that's a little more engaging. It gives the viewer a little more of a cycle. So. Let's have a more extreme king swing in the other direction. Have her tongue higher, move her jaw up. 
that bottom part of our jaw, the part that leads into the neck, I wanted to push it in because it looks kind of weird to not have other things shift on her face. We'll set up our loop one more time. Now that we have four frames, let's go ahead and see what it looks like. I'd like to see this without the background. Having a black background all the time feels a little boring to me. I'm curious what it would look like to animate different shades in the background. If I had it flip between black and white, for example, or between gray and black. Well, I think that might cause a seizure in some people. It's uh, very much a strobe light effect. Also, when it goes to the lighter background, it's very hard to see the key. I think it just flashes too bright for people to register that key. So I'm going to try tweening just those layers. I'm going to see if I can get more of a gradient effect going on. And by gradient effect, I mean I want to see black transition to a dark gray, to a lighter gray, to a lighter gray, and then go back to black. Now that I see my tween, this is going to take some finessing. I definitely need to turn some of these faces back on and off because when I tweened only those two layers, it left out all of the model's face. And I'm getting a little closer to what I want. I definitely think the bright white is not working for the key, so I'll probably switch that to something that's a little bit darker, a little more of a gray than a white. I also think I want the transition between these grays to be more subtle. I, I don't want it to go so rapidly from one shade of gray to another. I want these grays to be closer in tonality. So that's just a matter of adjusting the opacity of the black layer. Some of this fine tuning may feel like a lot of extra work to you, but believe me when I say I think it's worth it because we're trying to make animations that people would actually watch. And if you notice a flaw in something, other people are gonna notice a flaw in something. And if you just leave that flaw, um, then you're really handicapping your own work. There's a little better transition. I am noticing a flaw in the upper right corner. You'll notice that part of her hair is actually cut out. And that happened when I did my selection early on. I didn't notice that there were a few pixels in the upper right corner that were part of her hair that were taken. So I'm going to have to go back in and paint uh, black pixels in. I'll do that as soon as I get these light layers corrected. When I was only working against black, I didn't notice it, but now I definitely can see that missing pixel in the upper right corner on a few of these faces. One thing I think would be really cool is to see the model's eye blink in the shot. So what I'm gonna do is duplicate one of her faces. I'm going to erase out everything but the eye. And then I'm going to duplicate that eye section, use selections and warp to kind of close the eye. And when I get to the stage where the eye is as closed as it can be while still having an eyeball, I'm going to use the healing and stamp tools to basically create a blink. So this first step is to create a more closed eyeball with the warp tool. Just putting pins on the top of her eyelid and the bottom of her eyelid and shoving it together while keeping the rest of her face locked in place. Go ahead and duplicate that. Because this one's a little more complicated, I'm making sure I'm naming everything as I go along. Now I'm going to use the lasso tool. Just select the upper eyelid. I'm going to use transform to close it. Need to use eraser tool to kind of feather off these extra pixels if you have them in there. It's going to be a real obvious uh, blink, and I want my animation to be as smooth as possible. So you can see that eyelid is basically a blink. I need to select the bottom eyelid, do the same thing on its own layer. 
When I am doing my transformation, I take that center anchor point and I move it to where I want something to hinge. That makes it easy to rotate uh, the way that a normal eyelid would rotate, which is around the edge. I get in close there, use my eraser tool, and since the middle of the eye should be black when it blinks, I'm gonna go ahead and paint black in. If you have a photograph that you're working with that isn't as high contrast or graphic designy as this particular one is, you'll have to do a little more work than just painting it black. Uh, thankfully, this is a very high contrast black and white photo indeed, so painting it black solves the problem. Now that I have my blink constructed, I need to rebuild the skin around her eyelids. Otherwise, you're going to see the previous eyelids as I loop these in the animation timeline. So I'm using the stamp tool. There is a healing brush tool. It looks like a band-aid. That might work better in your own personal animations. For me, I'm using a very soft stamp cloning tool. I generally leave my hardness around zero when I do this kind of work. That way I have a nice feathered edge because I'm dealing with human skin. If you're trying to clone out something like a car or a tree in the background, it's likely you'll have your hardness up a lot higher than what I have my hardness at. Now, as I wrap up this blink section, I'm gonna move these layers in their own folder just for the sake of keeping my layer set a lot cleaner looking. And I do that by highlighting these three layers, dragging them down to a folder. All right, I have three sets of animations going on here. I have the ton waggling, I have the background changing color, and I have my eye blink. And I think the way I'm gonna set this up is a constant loop of the background color changing, a constant loop of the tongue waggling, and then as a secondary loop, I'm gonna have the eye blink. So you'll get a full tongue waggle with the eye open, then you'll get a tongue waggle with the eye blinking. I think having all three things going on at once is kind of distracting. And also, if I can make my animation longer by having a secondary animation in the second loop, but not in the first loop, I think that just feels more interesting. And there you have it, glass, olive, and key with the animation loop. I did, I am taking that extra step to color in the pixels that were missing in the upper right corner. Other than that, I think the work is complete.